raised on boys, born and bred, I think the thing that makes us so special and unique to me is the diversity in the area. There's so many different communities that all just seem to get along so well with one another, which is especially in places with lots going on with here and potentially where all that is happening. It's very multicultural, you know, uh, you see different people every day. Grangetown is so steeped in history, being so close to the docks, and also at the same time a place that's dynamic and changing. I grew up here and it's been a huge part of my life. It's very rich in culture, uh, traditions, religion. It's a beautiful, colourful place. Doing hot food pipe with my hand, I'm going to have this one here, I'm going to have it close up in there so you will know it's in Karai. Super loving, caring, and welcoming. People in Greenstone are the type to sit on their laurels and wait for things to be done for them. I mean, look at this building. They're people who will just get up and give things a go, and they do it side by side and shoulder by shoulder. The Grange Pavilion will benefit the Grangetown community because it'll be accessible to everyone. It will benefit the community because it's like a space and a hub where people can go to ask questions, where people can go and hang out rather than just hang around the street. In terms of what it means to me, I think it means that actually I'd be able to see our little girl grow up and have something that she truly believes is belonging to her and her friends. Bridge Pavilion will be a place where we can invite all different people, ethnicities and different uh, backgrounds. It will be a safe haven for people to express themselves. It's a real blank canvas, I think, for people to come together create their own activities or bring new activities into Grangetown Bridge Pavilion is that space where young people and others in the community can get together, get to know each other better and, and to bring that together and that's feeling. So can you put a, a pavilion in kind of purely of God I or basically in Grangetown? Maybe just in common step to ensure that it needs to know here. The Grange Pavilion, as it is today, will be open to everybody and we look forward to welcoming with everybody to the use of our space. Okay, sorry about that technical hitch, everyone. Um, so uh, with that, I will hand you over to uh, Mary. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, so as um, Alice mentioned, I'm, my name is Mary McVicker and I'm the academic lead of Community Gateway in Cardiff University. And I'm also a reader in the Welsh School of Architecture. And I'm talking today about a co-produced project which began eight years ago in 2012. Um, the development of the Grange Pavilion project in Grangetown, Cardiff, as a community owned and managed civic space. And I'd like to talk about the Grange Pavilion as representing far more than simply a building and to go through the steps by which a small group of residents took on a vacant and deteriorating asset um, and gathered a community as defined by a common interest in a civic space. And this image shows the building um, as it is now and as it's recently opened. Um, with a design by architect Dan Benham and IBI Group. Uh, this beautiful image by illustrator Jack Scrivens captures the stories of the Grange Pavilion's development from 2012 to the present day. While we now celebrate its opening, um, although tentatively under lockdown conditions, the process of its development has raised and continues to raise challenges and questions along the way. What does a space for all mean? What are the logistical and ethical implications of taking on a civic asset? How might the value of the civic space be defined? How do ambitions for quality reconcile with fears of accelerating gentrification? How can a small building in a small park act as a catalyst for actions amongst loose and fluid networks of residents and public private and third sector partners? And what role does the university play in all of this? So I'd like to talk through the co-productive nature of this project by first introducing Community Gateway and the intent that it set out in regards to partnership working. Walking through the process of developing the Grange Pavilion, I'd like to reflect on what the project has taught us and the questions that it continues to raise as we consider our next collective steps. So to first introduce Community Gateway, we're a Cardiff University based platform supporting long term and mutually beneficial partnerships between Cardiff University and communities in Grangetown in Cardiff. We are a core team of myself, 
Sarah Hughes as our communications officer, our Community Gateway Partnerships Manager, Ali Abdi, Lynn Thomas as our project manager, and Sophie Mills, who's recently joined us as the development manager for the Grange Pavilion. And every year we have a couple of paid student ambassadors, last year, Andrea and Josephine from Architecture and Journalism. The question I'd like to explore is what the civic role of a university is and how Community Gateway has sought to test that role. And I'd like to begin with this quote from Professor Sir David Watson of Brighton, which sets out a challenge to universities to be of and not just in the community, not simply to engage in knowledge transfer, but as he writes, to establish a dialogue across the boundary between the university and its community, which is open-ended, fluid and experimental. And for us, that sense of being open-ended, fluid and experimental has been absolutely critical in terms of how we've developed partnerships. It aligns to a challenge that we as representatives of, Grange, of Cardiff University were tasked with on our very first set of discussions in Grangetown. A resident advised us in no uncertain terms that if we were going to embark on any partnership between university and community, we should commit to a relationship and not an affair. Community Gateway had begun as a proposal by eight interdisciplinary academic and professional services staff. And we proposed that the university should make long-term commitments to geographically focused communities, and that we should pilot this with one community over at least a 10 year period. The desire for a long-term commitment had come out of our varied experiences with engagement between university and community. As an educator in architecture, I would routinely send my students into local communities to get to know them and to propose hypothetical ideas based on an afternoon or a day of conversations. Sometimes conversations would spark something, a possible exhibition, a live project looking for support, an interest in possibly developing something more between the community and the university. More often, it led to a room full of well-meaning ideas by well-meaning staff and students which went no further. I had a growing level of discomfort with the kind of engagement I was facilitating for a number of reasons. While we could perhaps try to get to know a place through statistical data and historical archives, and by sending students into a neighborhood or a town for no more than a day or two, it offered no more than a fleeting and um, shallow understanding of place. Any engagement through the form of interviews or surveys felt extractive, benefiting our students in, in developing their project work, but offering nothing tangible back to those who were giving their time and energy to engage with our students. The students' proposals were then top down, imposing ideas in a place that we really knew nothing about. This seemed to me to be the wrong message to send to architectural graduates whose practice would at some point impose real decisions upon these places. Community Gateway's proposal emerged out of these discomforts. We proposed that we engage long-term with one geographically defined community here at the electoral ward of Grangetown and give ourselves time to get to know a place. Community Gateway began with no objectives other than that of exploring the possibilities of partnership. The only criteria we defined was that of partnership and mutual benefit. That any activity have a university and a community partner and that any activity have tangible benefit for both. We emphasized the need of allowing for the open-endedness of a period of listening and waiting before proposing any action. So we first began in 2013 with a series of conversations about what a partnership could mean and what the university represented. We were well aware that those who were holding conversations with us were those who already had the time, the resources and the confidence to walk into a neighbourhood hall on a Monday evening to meet with a group of university staff and students. So we made no claim at all to know or to have reached a community after an evening of conversation. From contacts established through early conversations, we formally launched with an open call to any individual or organization in the community and in the university to suggest any idea, big or small, for partnership working and began work to matchmake across community and university. 
Some of these ideas found a fit immediately, others took four, five or six years to come to life, and others still remain latent, waiting for a partner to come along at the right time. From over 200 proposals, over 60 projects have emerged, like this one, Grange Town Business Forum and Shop Local Campaign, launched by resident Steve Duffy and School of Business academic Larry Rosier. Working with cycles of undergraduate and graduate business students to develop proposals in support of the launch of a Grange Town Business Forum, and I'll have more on that later. We had a proposal to collaborate with representatives of Somali communities in Grange Town, developing research on themes proposed by the community members, leading to a co-produced research project with Dr. Richard Gale and PhD researcher Nasir Adam, extending into research links with the Somaliland diaspora. Proposals for careers and role models networks and a Grange Town Youth Forum have been brought to life through Ali Abdi's leadership of a careers and role model week, a Grange Town Youth Forum and Sarja Patel, Jeff Allen and Thanasia Thulis's promoting academic excellence modeling of long-term mentoring with local schools. So out of these projects, the Grange Pavilion project was the very first to come to the table. A group of residents wanted to do something about a recently vacated Bulls Pavilion, which was starting to deteriorate in a local park. Identifying the potential of institutional support to build partnership capacity, the group approached Cardiff University as, quote, an organisation with resources that could assist and practically help the process along, end quote. So our partnership began in 2013 with a brief written by the residents of the Grange Pavilion Project and the Welsh School of Architecture. Nine undergraduate students held conversations across Grangetown, gauging interest in and supporting um, doing something about vacant properties, including the Grange Pavilion. In 2014, we held our first joint event as an ideas picnic, opening up the Bowes Pavilion for the first time and inviting people in for conversations, tea and cake. For architecture students, these studios represented a deviation from their normal mode of practice of proposing a building. The step of doing no more than listening and paying attention began to change the way we approached architectural education and made us think more carefully about what we could offer as architects. This aligned with the broader discussion in architectural practice about the nature of architectural practice, suggesting that the skills and ways of thinking architects use to produce buildings could be deployed in other settings. The broader context our partner was working in, our partnership was working in, was that of an age of austerity in which civic assets across the UK were being devolved from government to community groups. The launch of the Stepping Up programme by Cardiff Council in 2011, suggesting that residents could step up and take over civic assets um, and services, on the one hand created an opportunity for the small group of residents to then step up and take over their local community space. This also, of course, presented considerable challenges. As Suzanne Hall noted in 2015, the decentralization of power to take over civic assets happening in this period was not accompanied by decentralization of the resources to develop and manage these assets. The residents group had no funds to do anything with the building. They had no clear definition of what the building should be or who it should be for. They made no claim to represent the community or to know what the community would want of this building. Collectively now, however, we had evidence of interest, growing support, an agreement to collaborate and a pile of ideas in no formal order. Our 2015 joint studio began to formalize the shape of our partnerships in Grangetown. Project manager, Rosie Cripps, and architect, academic and Grangetown resident Neil Turnbull launched Love Grangetown, pairing undergraduate students with 12 community members from six Grangetown communities, training both together in appreciative inquiry and co-production techniques. Under appreciative inquiry principles, students and community members were tasked with adopting an asset-based approach 
to gather together a community defined set of priorities within and for Grangetown. Conversations and surveys focused on positive memories and highlighted moments of feeling connected to community rather than simply identifying problems to be fixed. The students and community members reached out within and across communities in Grangetown, reaching 100 people in conversations over three weeks and bringing together a core group in a partnership planning and celebration event. The architecture students and their partners analysed the interviews and surveys and directing their skills and ways of working towards the design of a partnership rather than the design of a building, visualised the results showing here residents' memories of ways in which Grangetown supported a sense of belonging to a community. The analysis of the interviews and the surveys identified and prioritised nine key themes of interest and concern to Grangetown residents, organisations and businesses, and defined the structure under which our partnership would work. Community space, and in particular, a neutral space accessible to all Grangetown communities, was highlighted by the residents involved as their key priority and ambition. With evidence of need and interest now formally logged, our partnership now began working with Cardiff Council in earnest to begin opening up the vacant building to test out collected ideas in the space. A storytelling event with um, local arts organisation Artshell in 2015 was the first physical intervention creating a small movable booth to share stories and ideas, to decorate as a stage, to use as a workshop space, and to have as a music venue. The pavilion became a home for testing out ideas in a fast, flexible, and low cost approach. It supported ideas by beginning to connect individuals and organizations in a growing network. Events and activities at the pavilion began to pull together individuals and organisations already in the area to begin collaborating more, holding us in awareness to an, to an awareness of the value of existing organisations and the value of their existing work in the area. A formalised partnership between the Grange Pavilion Project, the long established Grangetown Community Action and Cardiff University enabled us to take on a one-year residency, then a three-year residency, to temporarily fix up the building and to be present on a daily basis. This gave time and space for residents and organisations to launch sports mentoring, girls-only football, careers weeks, after-school clubs, tech cafes, a weekly youth club, giving us growing evidence of support, interest and ambition. If the pavilion as it stood at the time could achieve this as an uninsulated, leaky, non-disabled access, non-disabled accessible facility, what more could be asked of it? The very first conversation between resident Richard Powell and Cardiff Council had emphasised an ambition of quality show that quality exists here in Grangetown, the Grange Pavilion project had set out as a core ambition. Securing stage one's big lottery funded supported the ambition of growing beyond a make do fix up of the existing building and supported the group's desire to develop a building with the capacity and the resources to meet the kinds of demands the three year residency had evidenced. One of our running jokes was that the project kept developing because no one had said no. A catalytic moment for us was that of an unsuccessful funding application, which suggested that while the project would provide significant community benefit, it would not provide reasonable value for money. A community space, the feedback suggested, should be cheaper. Certainly, according to UK standardised average costings for construction, the Grange Pavilion cost more per square metre than the average published costs for a community hall. Yet it still cost less than the average cost for a luxury flat. This raised a broader question for us. What did reasonable value for money mean within this project? 
What does value for money mean? The National Museum of Wales once raised funds through hundreds of small donations with a pamphlet expressing outrage at the idea that Cardiff should ever be contented to sit with a second-rate municipal museum. Our ongoing partnerships now began to take up the idea of what the value of this civic space meant. Working with architecture students, we began identifying physical moments where value could mean recognition of historical and cultural traces of quality and craft throughout Grangetown. We began to map the value of what it took to create a civic space. Here, a student mapped the time given by members of the Grange Pavilion project over a three year period and the value of that time given to meetings, emails, conversations to make a civic space work. 495 emails in one year alone from one member of the project. In The Value of Everything, economist Mariana Matsukato proposes a reversal of prevailing assumptions regarding the definition and measurement of value. We must reconsider, Matsukato writes, the stories we are telling about who the value creators are and what that says to us about how we define activities as economically productive and unproductive. In a shifting landscape of definitions of value creation, the Wellbeing for Future Generations Wales Act 2015 sets out provisions requiring public bodies to pursue the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales according to sustainable development principles and specifically demonstrating the importance of balancing short-term needs with the need to safeguard the ability to meet long-term needs. So how then do we measure the value of a community university partnership and the value of this co-produced space? We can turn to quantitative metrics, the numbers of people reached, the amount of money raised. We can start to measure it through narratives of personal and collective impact, such as an interview here with Masim Sulman, who'll be running the um, Hideout Cafe in the Grange Pavilion um, as of next week. We can measure the value of the time and the openness to build relationships between and across community and university. And we can consider the definition of value extending beyond that of cost per square meter and reframing value within the long-term cultural change provoked by the Wellbeing Act. But we understand that our, consequent, our, our, our actions have consequences. Ambitions for the pavilion sits within a broader alertness to the unintended consequences of our collective actions that the redevelopment might be inadvertently unwelcoming, that it might be a factor in gentrification. A long-term partnership looks beyond the end of any singular project and sticks around to work with consequences, positive and negative. Tweets from a residence group in Grangetown express a desire. We want our city back. As a university, we have shared and exchanged our institutional resources, knowledge, skills, ideas, and privileges with community partners. And we have brought our institutional weight to bear on the development of a building. Our civic role and responsibility extends beyond this. And as we all respond to a COVID and post-COVID context within renewed understandings of social, racial, economic, and ecological inequalities in our cities, we have a role in supporting broader actions towards more equitable, livable cities. So we have made a commitment to a relationship and not an affair. But this must also balance with the question, as activist David Froud posed, of when it is more appropriate to get out of the way by recognising the power relationship still at play in any relationship and of how we offer long-term partnership in an equitable and balanced way. This does not mean that we step away, but that we stay alert to imbalances in power and understand when our role is valid and appropriate and when it is not. For now, our commitment to co-production extends into the building as it becomes activated. 
and our commitment extends into being a part of ongoing support for its long-term viability. A partnership for the Grange Pavilion CIO is now in place with a 99-year lease. This lease extends beyond our lifetimes and it changes our conception of exit strategies and end of project evaluations. To return to Sir David Watson's um, emphasis of the importance of open-ended, fluid and experimental approaches to partnership. We can say that the privilege and luxury of having had time and space to be open-ended, fluid and experimental has been critical. In a change in global and local context, we understand our partnership itself as constantly open-ended, fluid and experimental. And we will return to an online Love Grange Town in November to again reassess the priorities, ambitions and challenges ongoing and new partnership projects may respond to. And we welcome any interest in working with us in any capacity and in any theme. For now, we are pleased to be launching a partnership event at the Grange Pavilion, an outdoor, socially distanced Grange Town World Market, this coming Saturday, 17th of October, 10 to 2, for any of those within Cardiff City boundaries who can join us. And we hope you can join us to celebrate on our first formal opening event. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mary. That was really interesting. Um, lovely to hear about the project. Um, have we got any questions uh, for Mary? Oh, oh yeah, bear with me one second. I've got Angelina who would like to ask you a question, Mary. Hi, Mary. That was really interesting because I've heard a lot over the years about the Grangetown Pavilion projects and the work there between the university and Grangetown. And I was just thinking that one of those last slides you said about a 99 year lease and having the, I forget the name of the group, the sort of supervisory group or something you said. Um, the Grange up. Pavilion CIO. And you said that it changes the way you think about exit strategies. So, I mean, it seems like there is no exit strategy in a sense, if it's a 99 year lease and just thinking about what that means in terms of the commitment from the university and how that was negotiated. So the commitment from the university formally is to stay, is to have representation on the CIO um, organizational board for that 99 years. Um, so that's, um, I would like to push for more commitment, although I understand that things are always changing and so it's difficult to make um, longer term predictions, but certainly the representation of the university, so membership in the CIO and engagement in the CIO for that 99 years. So I think it starts to think, of, you know, we start to think about who's coming up behind us, um, who's getting involved with the project now, and who starts to take on leadership um, once we move away from the project for various reasons. And that was the other thought that, or question I'd had is, how, what has the turnover looked like within the team from Cardiff University? I mean, have you had a very a consistent presence of the core participants? Because I know like with students, for example, they kind of come and go and um, how you're able to sort of regulate that, I guess. And if you've noticed impact as a result of turnover in staff at all. Yes, yeah, so, we, so we've been, I think what's been really critical about the project is that it's been supported at university executive board level. And so we've had funding up, um, up to date and for a few more years yet of a core staff. And I think a lot of engagement projects tend to be woefully underfunded and really dependent on altruistic voluntary efforts from um, staff members doing work and above and beyond their normal roles. This project um, has full-time um, posts assigned to roles and they've been consistent throughout. Um, the students do come and go every year and that sort of raises questions for us about how we bring students into an ongoing project. And so there's a, there's a pedagogical stance of students understanding that they're a small part of a much larger whole. Um, but there's also an ethical and ethos training that we give to students at the beginning of working with us because we understand all of our partnerships as fragile and uh, you know, 
partnerships can be inadvertently destroyed by a new group of students coming in and misunderstanding what we're trying to do or misrepresenting Grangetown as a whole. Um, so that's that's certainly something that we've built into the whole thing. But the, so the, the staff um, from the university side have been reasonably consistent, and I've been involved with it since 2012. The CIO itself is set up as 60% resident um, and 40% organisations. And the organisations are there to give the long-term institutional support. So it's Cardiff University, Cardiff and Vale College, um, TAF Housing, um, RSPB Kimry and Cardiff Bay Rotary Club. And that sort of also picks up the, the aspect of the residents themselves changing. So we've had, for example, residents who've passed away during the project um, and some of their images have shown up in the slides here. And so you know, we, we understand that people's lives will change and people will move on and change jobs, move in and out of the area and so on. So the institutional um, wing of that support is to try and build in that, long, that longevity and to try and um, bring in a sort of core level of support regardless of the staff changes and student and staff students and resident changes. Could I ask just one more small question? Um, it was just, um, you said that you give training to students before they get involved with it. I wonder if there's any thinking about um, doing that training beyond the project, because I think co-production is a big thing within the university and the, a lot of the funding bodies really kind of include that in their different um, grant funding calls. And I wonder, because it seems like kind of training that lots of people could really benefit from in, in the university. And I wonder if there's any thoughts to kind of scale that up or make that available to, to other people in the university. When, when we first launched, we were one of five key projects that were being rolled out as um, a transforming communities um, scheme. And that went from the sort of hyper local with us working in Grangetown up to projects like the Phoenix Project, um, and community journalism um, and city region exchange projects. And there's also the Car Heritage Project, which is a fantastic project within the university. And there was quite a lot of mapping done at the time in terms of what the academics involved in these kinds of projects knew and what, what training we'd had. Um, I came into this as an architect, having had no training at all in co-production and really sort of learned it all um, through the project. And so I think mapping, what we knew mapping what we didn't know and mapping the gaps in our expertise um, we worked with Cardiff University's engagement team at the time to develop a, um, or to, to sort of identify what kind of training staff would need and so the engagement team produced a series of um, training modules at that time um, I'm not sure if they're, they're still now available and if there's a record of those but we certainly went through a lot of training as a result of identifying the gaps in our expertise um, and I think that's, but it's certainly something we'd be interested in doing further. I know that um, Dave White was sitting in on, on the webinar and he's done an enormous amount as well in terms of um, being able to roll out training through SHARE and um, to sort of try and capture and formalize some of the lessons learned from the engagement projects. Alice, you're um, muted. Sorry, I was coughing. Um, thanks, Angelina, that's great. Um, yeah, we do, you do have a comment from Dave, but it's quite a long comment and there are some other questions. So I'll, I'll send that to you afterwards. Um, so I will try and do this in um, the order that the questions came in. So we've got another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, like I've heard a lot about this, this project and I'm particularly interested in community participation and co-design and production of the community. But I'm aware of the, um, the challenges regarding financing of such projects. Um, so I'd like to know a bit more on how the project was um, sponsored or financed. Because you mentioned about um, the kind of, what is the value for money? And um, mm -hmm. this I myself has, Face these challenges before when I try to build something or co, co create something with the community and um, and there is also challenge in terms of when we would like when we want to evaluate part of this um, in research um, uh, funding from 
even research organizations for evaluation of such design mm -hmm. is quite tricky. So uh, yeah, I'd like to know more in that way. And the second thing is, I, I think uh, I have recently joined Cardiff University. Um, and Welcome. I'd, <laughs> thank you. So I'd like to know more about the future plans and because I, I'm, part, I'm very much interested in what Community Gateway is doing. Well, great. Well, 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 do get in touch with us and um, and start to work with us. We always welcome collaborations. Um, and you know, there, there's various ways that we can invite people to get involved with us. And often that, that means just coming down and having a coffee um, when we can when, when, under social distancing, but just coming down and sort of um, listening for, for a while before proposing anything. And things like the, um, the PACE project, the Promoting Academic Excellence project, came out of Sarja Patel coming down and just observing and listening and talking to people before proposing anything. So we'd be delighted um, for, to have involvement. Um, the project itself is, I think what we've been incredibly lucky um, in is that the project was fully funded within the university. And that is what allowed for the open-endedness of the project. Um, you know, I think even though research councils and research funding promote aspects of co-production, we find that it's very difficult to achieve any kind of research funding or any kind of external funding that allows for a completely open-ended set, um, set of conversations with no objective in mind. But that's what made the absolute difference for us, the fact that we were able to come in without having a predefined objective, without having a predefined project in place. Um, Community Gate, we came out originally out of the Cardiff Futures workshop. So the eight staff members who proposed it had met each other on the Cardiff Futures workshop. And I think with Cardiff Futures, it's a, it's a leadership program run by the vice chancellor. It gives you the opportunity to meet members of the university executive board face to face and to pitch ideas face to face. And that sort of, um, ability to meet somebody face to face and to start to develop trust gave us the scope to be able to propose something that was risky and that didn't have a predefined concept of where it was going. And I think that willingness to allow it to happen and to sort of test it out sort of really came out of having been able to make those, convers um, make those connections in the first place with university executive board members. So we're, we're always so sort of very aware of how unusual it was to be funded within the university for a project that had um, so little definition at that point but also how significantly important it was to be able to run a project that didn't have that definition because that's what allowed us to go in and um, really develop relationships because we, we weren't imposing ideas top down. So we've been funded now um, for a total of eight years um, and that's funded a full-time project manager, part-time partnerships manager and a part-time communications officer. And I really don't think it could happen without that because the amount of time when we, when we start mapping how much engagement takes anyone who's involved in engagement knows how much time it takes just to be able to you know, do the basics, um, the organization of setting up those um, relationships and the um, hurdles of going through all of the bureaucracies. And um, you know, the, to, I think just the sort of sheer amount of effort that goes into it isn't something that happens in the evening on top of academic activities. So we, we've been I think, really lucky to have that. And that's something that we, we do now want to capture in terms of saying as a pilot and as a sort of value for money in the, in the broad scheme of things in the university. Um, it's, it's funded better than most engagement projects, but it's also, I think, an enormous value for money in terms of what it offers and the, the connections that it's built through that. Um, does, that does that answer the question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can understand the unusual. Um, I can understand. Yeah, um, I, that is very clear. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, it's a, the fact that it's unusual is um, we've been giving presentations to other universities and sharing those experiences with other universities um, in the hope that this becomes something that's more normative and business as usual rather than a one off unusual type of project. You mentioned also evaluation and we're about to start evaluation and we're actually looking for some support on starting evaluation. So if anyone can support us with that. Um, the big lottery funding for, um, which has been the, sort of the, the core funding for the Grange Pavilion requires evaluation over a five year period, but is really interested in evaluation, which is meaningful rather than simply a tick boxing exercise. And it's funded through the big lottery. 
um, and we're interested in the evaluation being something that sort of forces us to reflect and to critically evaluate what we're doing and learn from it and capture it rather than it simply being a tick box exercise. And so I think the, the, the fact that Big Lottery builds that into its funding is really significant and it's certainly something that I would hope to see in um, research funding um, criteria and, and to be able to sort of properly fund that, that end aspect of the work. Thanks for mentioning it because um, that's uh, just briefly I'll mention that uh, so I co-designed a, a sm small project school ground uh, with the community and children um, as part of my PhD so I, I evaluated it matching with the control school and that's when I, the, the, I, I would say I'm, I'm kind of devoted to kind of scaling up those that project and the, the the problems or challenges I faced when 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 find trying to find sponsor for for building that school ground, um, mm -hmm. and then when I wanted to scale it up, the the problem with the kind of try, um, yeah, so finding the um, appropriate kind of um, sponsors. Um, uh, but thanks for mentioning about the evaluation. I I, I will be I I'll be contacting you Great, afterwards. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks both. Um, so Dave has asked me to um, just pick out the question at the end of his comment. So sorry, sorry about that, Dave. I missed that. So he says, um, given the coming storm, the university has a huge role to play in the challenges that will be faced. Your thoughts are welcome on community gateways and as not only an example, but as a model for university social mission going forward. Um, we've always hoped to see this as a pilot that would be repeated in other communities. Um, so not just, you know, it's not just about how the university operates with, with Grange on its own, but just the model of having a really dedicated team working long-term with one particular community. And I don't think we'd be looking to, you wouldn't look to replicate exactly the same thing because we understand that every community is completely different and that it brings its own set of questions and opportunities and challenges and personalities and so on. I think what's really core is just giving that time and space to spend time listening. Um, and so something as simple as giving, you know, we, we've done a lot of arguing of allocating time um, in workload models and so on, but also allocating roles within the university just to be that, that sort of gateway point, that point of um, conversation between university and community um, to be able to put that into other communities. I know that um, working with Dave, we've been hoping to try and set up some learnings between um, Ely Cairo and Grangetown and to sort of bring together Community Gateway and Cairo. And so that's, that's sort of the hope for our next stage. Again, it's just a case of either finding the external funding to allow for that open-endedness. I think as well as trying to find funding to allow for open-endedness, there's also an issue about research funders um, or engagement funders supporting long-term projects because there's also this constant drive to try and find something new and to you know not, not to necessarily support things that are ongoing um, and that's certainly what we found in our own experiences through Kyra and Community Gateway um, so yeah so the, the hope is that we can form a clear enough argument to be able to say this works well enough to replicate aspects of it and the core aspect being the open-endedness the dedicated relationship um, and employment um, from within the community as part of the team um, so that we're not um, embarking on extractive relationships with local communities. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. Okay, we've got another question um, from Taru says, I'd like to ask about how local people have taken part in the project. Is there a core group of residents that has been involved since the beginning in the form of the association or has who takes part during the project Sorry. Change during the duration of the project. Sorry. Yeah, so it's so it's a mixture of both. Um, there's a fantastic piece of research by um, participatory cities that sort of um, outlined some of the key uh, the key challenges of participation and co-production. And one of them, um, and, and it starts to sort of identify you know, it, things like issues like burnout and so on. And we're certainly aware that working with the same core group of residents. Um, can lead to burnout and can lead to, to, to too much dependence and too much expectation of the time and the energy and the resources of individuals. Um, the Love Grangetown model is a model where we go back annually um, and this, this year we're, we're slightly delayed in running it, but we typically run Love Grangetown around May. 
and that's where we again sort of set up our students with a core group of residents, but then they're tasked with reaching out to people who haven't been engaged with the project. So you might start off with six or 12 residents. They then each have to find five more people who haven't been involved with the project at all. And so out of that, we try and sort of build in the momentum to bring in new people. And as a sort of planning and strategy day every year, we have this sort of planning and strategy aspect of it in the morning where we bring together um, the feedback from interviews and questionnaires and conversations and start to sort of redefine the nine key themes we're working under. But we always have a big party in the afternoon. And the big party is the really important part because that's, again, sort of just raises interest, builds momentum, gets the word out and brings new people in. So while we have a sort of core group of residents, particularly in the Grange Pavilion um, CIO and then projects like um, Grange Town World Market and um, the core group of residents who really led on to those, those key projects, um, we also are constantly looking to bring new people in and to sort of understand that we're we're constantly having to get the word out, you know, and, and not sort of rest and, and sort of see the partnership as something fixed and unchanging. It's, it's constantly fluid and constantly open. So I think, I think building in that expectation that people will come and go and that some, some projects within the bigger umbrella will, will end and perhaps come back to life. Um, one of the slides I showed showed the mapping of the time that somebody spent on over a three year period. And one, what was important about that was that it, it, it wasn't sort of consistently growing up. It was um, amount, a huge amount of effort and then dropping down to zero and then a huge amount of effort again and then dropping down to zero. And so understanding that cycle that projects will sort of take off and then will falter, um, it's, you know, I think reminds us to not only stick around for the long term, so rather than seeing a project that's getting up and running and then that's the end of it. Um, you know, the fact that we, we try to come back and be there when it falls back down to zero, but also that you might need somebody else to come in and pick it up again. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a sort of fluid and it's, it's both stable and fluid in terms of who's involved. Brilliant, thank you, Mary. Um, got a comment from Ambrina says, a really thoughtful presentation, thank you. I've been wanting to know more about for ages. I wondered if thinking about your involvement in the project, you could say a little about what might be interesting issues that law students might find in the project, for example, land or planning. Um, many, cer certainly land and certainly planning. And there's there's a core group of residents who have um, who have been looking for support in those areas. I think more importantly, though, it's to get students um, asking the question. So rather than us defining what be, what what partners would find interesting, is to carve out space where resident partners can start to define the kind of questions that they've got um, coming up for law students. So if there's an interest in law students embarking on live projects, it could be something similar to, um, for example, the School of Business in which um, one resident, Steve Duffy, sort of set out a brief for, for business school students and the students responded to that brief. So if you're interested in um, bringing law students in to have conversations, um, or to sort of embark on a series of conversations, that's something that we could we could build, for example, into the Love Grange Town, which we're planning for um, for November of this year, and that's that's where we sort of usually start to find out the partnerships where people will come forward with an idea, and we try and match make it um, either across university or across um, community. So, so it, it can work in both directions. We can have a proposal of um, work that a school is doing that communities might find of interest or community members coming forward with an idea that might match make back to a school. Brilliant, thanks, Mary. Um, okay, uh, it says, I think this is a key issue. Could you tell us what kind of work went into getting the senior university level commitment of resource? That's an interesting question. So I think that, that sort of goes back to the fact that this project emerged out of uh, Cardiff Futures leadership workshop and the fact that we had been able to have a series of conversations and it was actually over the course of a year. So it was meeting UEB members um, once um, a month over the course of a year and developing the project and developing the proposal going out having initial conversations and coming back but having that that ability to have face-to-face -face conversations um, and you know, I, th I think um, having you know, asking them to sort of take a risk and to trust in the proposal but also having the evidence um, in the original business case that this was something that residents welcomed, that we had partnership possibilities in place and we sort of had statistical evidence in terms of what the university um, could be addressing um, with, with some of the challenges that residents had identified and so on. So, so it was, yes, to, to get to the business case, it was a, a year of initial conversations in the community 
to build up a business case to go to UEB, um, but also face-to-face -face conversations with UEB that were facilitated through um, a management course, and, um, which de deliberately set up um, abilities to have those conversations. And I think that that's the thing that's hard to replicate and I'm not quite sure how to, how, you know, I think other than sort of urging the university to allow more space for these face-to-face -face conversations um, and to allow these kinds of ideas to emerge. Brilliant. Thanks, Mary. Um, so we've got a question from um, Alice. It said, thanks, Mary, for a really informative and thought-provoking talk and congratulations on getting the building open. What do you think are the biggest barriers to Cardiff University academics engaging with Grangetown, Grangetown Gateway and how can these be overcome? I think time and support, um, workload models that you know, see that have historically seen engagement as something altruistic and voluntary and on top of everything else that you're already doing. Um, it can be overcome, I think, partly we, and at an earlier stage in the project, we had job descriptions for academics who were going to be taking on key leads in each of the areas and building in support from line managers and heads of schools. And we've done various presentations to heads of schools about the importance of allocating time for people just to come down and have those early conversations. Um, that certainly came out of the School of Medicine with um, the PACE project, um, where an academic was given the time just to come down and have open-ended conversations. So I think firstly, you know, support, support from heads of school and from line managers in terms of giving that open-endedness um, for academics to come down and explore ideas without having something specific proposed in mind. Um, the other thing is to build it into everyday business. So live teaching, um, research, I mean, pretty much everything I've done since 2012 has been focused in Grangetown and all my work as a, as a researcher and all my work as, a, as an educator has been directed towards that. So we're interested in um, finding ways in which, you know, if, the, if there's a moment in a research schedule where there's a pause in existing research projects and something you could start up, we'd be happy to have conversations with anyone at that point. And that's where, for example, the, the Somaliland research um, came up where we had an academic member who was interested in picking up but had to wait for three years. So again, the, the nature of having something that's long-term um, allows people to express an interest and then perhaps to come back to us two or three years later when the timing works. Thank you, Mary. I think you've probably answered the next question and a few of the last questions, but I'll read it out anyway. So it's a question from Steve. It says, there's been a lot of engagement with architecture in the business school. Are there plans for more Cardiff Uni departments to work on future projects or research in Grangetown? I know you've answered that slightly, but if there's any. Yeah, and just, um, and hi, Steve. It's, it's great that you're here. Um, yes, I mean, we're, we're always looking for engagement from any schools. We've got a number of new projects that are starting up um, the School of Dentistry has recently approached us and we're trying to work with them across the school's advisory panel that we run in Grangetown with nursery, primary and um, high school, high schools in Grangetown. And so there's an interest in sort of dental health projects coming up. Um, we've hoping to reinstigate the Philosophy Cafe, um, which did um, take off for a while and hopefully will take back up once we get the cafe running again. Um, and we've had a number of projects working across different departments. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's just a case of people coming to us with an idea and finding that match at the right time. We hope that coming back to Love Grangetown in November, and we also typically run an annual Connections to Grangetown event, which was also postponed this year due to COVID, but that's usually the event in which we invite all of the existing partners um, working with us in the university to present updates on their projects and invite new academics to come in and um, propose ideas. So. Hopefully in, in November, if we can do something um, as an online version of Love Grace, and we're still trying to figure out how the party aspect would work. Um, but hopefully that'll be a chance to kind of reset and to bring in a new group of people. So if, if you have any ideas that you'd like to bring forward, um, we're always happy to, to try and uh, match, make them up. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. Um, there's um, a comment from Tal says, thanks, Mary, more of a general comment to everyone here than a question. Considering there is so much area specific research undertaken by university staff, but there is an abundance of teaching focusing on specific places, some uni wide mapping of these would be immensely helpful. Where there is an updated simple Excel sheet or more sophisticated interactive or GIS mapping, it will be a great resource in creating cross school collaboration. Um, agreed. And that, that sounds like a project for um, 
a postgraduate researcher or a PhD, or we, we, we also work quite a lot with the CURUP and CUSEP schemes, which allow us to take in student internships over the summer. And they do quite a lot of the mapping that I showed, um, so all the graphic mapping. So once a year, we get a couple of students in to kind of sift through everything that we've done, and they start to put together analysis. Um, and I think um, Andrea was joining us today, um, possibly, and so she, she was heavily involved in that that sort of aspect of being able to analyze and capture what we've done. Um, in November, we'll have Professor Asidin Inam um, giving a talk and we'll make that um, available uh, for others to join us, but he'll be reflecting on three years of relationships between the Masters of Urban Design course in Grangetown and they've done a lot of mapping as well. So it's just, it's a case of um, sort of finding, putting it all into one place. And I think one of the things that we're probably guilty of is that we're we're doing all the time, but we don't build enough time in for that sort of capturing and formalization of what we're doing. So if you have thoughts about ways to create um, a simple Excel sheet or sophisticated interactive GIS map, um, we'd, we'd love to work with you on it. Brilliant, thanks Mary. There's just, um, oh, I was gonna say two final comments, but I think we've got one, one further question. So we'll, we'll go to that and then we'll, um, we'll end it there. So there's a comment from Ambrina saying, we'll definitely be in touch, thank you. And again from Alice saying thank you very helpful I'll be in touch about our civil society research center and how we could work with you um, and the final question then from Amali says how have you are you planning to measure value particularly when this is in the form of a long term return um, so we're just about to start bringing in an evaluator for the Grange Pavilion and that's one of the questions that we're going to be looking at and it's a question that I'm exploring with my um, Masters of Architecture unit in terms of how we engage or how, how we um, how we measure value and I think it really is of almost every way we can so you know quantitative measurement in terms of the economics of the project um, we, we, we've got we've got five sort of key objectives that we've set out with the big lottery and that does include the business viability of the project long term but it also includes things like biodiversity on site um, sense of connectedness to community, um, the number of people that we've engaged with and so on. So I think it's, it's a sort of mixture of quantitative surveys, but also qualitative narratives. And part of, I think part of the idea of the long-term project is that we can work with the same people through a number of years. And so, for example, we have um, one amazing um, student ambassador joining us this year who was first a member of the Grangetown Youth Forum and now has become um, now a second year law and politics um, student at Cardiff University and is setting up the Grangetown Youth Forum Student Society um, with Cardiff University and then we'll sort of be putting in place a sort of succession plan for, for his role and so being able to kind of track the impact that um, partnership working has had on both staff and students and um, residents over a 10 year period rather than trying to sort of convey uh, value over a much shorter term period um, is just definitely something that we're interested in. Thank you, Mary. I think we've just hit one o'clock and I think we've managed to answer all the questions, so perfect timing. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. It was uh, yeah, fascinating to learn more about the project and it sounds like there's lots of interest from people to get more involved. So that's, uh, that's brilliant. Right. Okay, so yes. uh, We'll end it there. Just to remind everyone, if you have anything or you want to rewatch, it will be available online um, probably within a week or so. We'll aim to do that. Um, and if anyone um, wants contact details for Mary or um, there's any other questions, then do let us know. But thank you again for joining us, Mary. And um, yeah, <laughs> see you thank soon. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions and comments. It's really appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.